Good morning. I'm uh, not a handyman. The table is about half the size. I don't even want to try to lift it up. I told Jeremy he can fix, fix that because I don't know how to even do that. So, <laughs> But uh, turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and uh, we'll read the first uh, two verses in 1 Corinthians 16 uh, together, and then we'll look into the Word of God uh, further. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Now about the collection for God's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. I want to pray for the uh, boxes, the shoe boxes that came in for the recipients that will be getting in the next weeks, um, that they get into the right hands of the children, the children know that the Lord loves them, other people love them, and that they get to hear the gospel through uh, the presentation of those boxes. also want to pray for um, the, the people of Paris as well, so let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a great God, and we pray that Jesus is the king of each one of us here. Lord, that we have made that choice to follow Jesus. Lord, I lift up those shoe boxes. I thank you for all that have brought in. Uh, the, the boxes for the boys and girls across the world. And I pray that those who receive them know that they are loved, that they're important to you and to us. And Father, I pray that uh, when we get to heaven, that some of those recipients will be there as well because of the gospel going out as well. And Father, I pray for the people of Paris, and I ask that you bring about... Uh, your peace. I pray that in their time of need that they would realize that you are an ever-present help in time of trouble and you're an omnipresent God and that they can cry out to you. And I pray that you would give them peace and hope and comfort. Lord, today as we talk about um, the spiritual discipline of giving, I pray that we would open our hearts to what you have for us and we'd make application as you so desire. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It was great last night in Pittsburgh at the Consul Energy Center to um, go hear Chris Tomlin in concert and to worship together. Um, it was wonderful because I can't sing, but you can sing as loud as you want there and nobody else can hear you. So that was, and I'd say there were probably 15, 16,000 people there because the floor was full and most of it except for behind the stage. So it was a, a great, great trip and a, a great time of worship. This morning, I'll talk about tithing and uh, if you've been following along and you read your bulletin, you know by now that in two weeks we will be officially on our own as a church. And God's done an incredible work, blessed us immeasurably since our first service a little over three years ago at the Westwood Theater. God's seen fit to allow us to move into this current place where we worship together. And He's led us to expand our staff and our ministries. And little did we imagine, dream three years ago, that we would need to add staff so quickly. But God has graciously, God has supernaturally provided. And I can't ever possibly praise His name enough and, and thank Him adequately for the great things that He's done in our midst these past three years. I have to confess that there are days when I ask myself, and sometimes I even say to Sandy, what are we doing going on our own as a church? We no longer have any backing of our sending church, uh, any fallback, no cushion. But God is in control. And I'm convinced that this is His perfect plan for us. I, if you've studied the Scriptures at all, and uh, some of you have taken the experience in God's study, which is right out of the Word of God, God wants us as individuals, as families, as a body of believers, to be in a place where we must solely rely on Him. And uh, we as a body of believers here are at that place. And we have to step up to the plate and report for duty we need, and I believe we are, 100% fully committed to what God wants to do in our community. Because we're a very young congregation, I think it's critical to speak on various subjects and share from the Scriptures how we can all be involved in and participate in the Lord's work here. This morning I'm going to talk about tithing, and I, I'm well aware that a lot of pastors steer clear of ever mentioning anything about giving and money and finances. 
And I understand their hesitancy, their reluctancy to speak on money. I've heard people comment, all our pastor, all our church ever seems to want to talk about, and all they ever ask is for our money. That's a touchy subject. The truth, there's a lot of touchy subjects when it comes to preaching. Money, sex, sin, the consumption of alcohol, the paying of taxes, lawsuits, and on and on. And maybe some of you think, well, you know what? I've heard it all when it comes to money. You may think to yourself, well, I know where he's going to go before he even gets started. Maybe you've heard the story of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He was a charismatic president in our nation. And he grew weary from the countless times that he was in receiving lines at the White House. And he felt like, you know what? A lot of people aren't even paying attention when they come through the line. They don't even know what's being said. It's like sometimes in church, are people paying attention to each other when they're greeting each other? And so one day he said uh, at a reception he was going to try an experiment, he told himself. And as each person filed by in this receiving line, he reached out his hand, and as he did, and they shook hands with him, he murmured, I murdered my grandmother today. And people responded with things like, congratulations. We're so proud of you. You're doing a good job. God bless you. Finally, at the end of the line came the ambassador from Bolivia, and when FDR said, I murdered my grandmother this morning, the ambassador leaned over and whispered in his ear, I'm sure she had it coming. <laughs> well, I have no doubt that some of us are like those guests. We think what we know what's going to be said, so we decide, I'm going to check out. I'm not really going to pay attention because I've heard it all before. Please, don't tune me out because I believe I have some startling, unusual things to say to you. To tithe or not, that's a great subject of ongoing interest to Christians. And I want to offer you three vital reasons why we should talk about tithing, why it's a vital subject. First of all, it's important to talk about tithing because the fact is there's a lot of confusion about it. You listen to one Bible teacher, he has something to say about it. And then you turn around and listen to another one, he has something vastly different to offer. Go to one church and a pastor says one thing. Go down the road to another church and the pastor there says something else. Same way with Bible commentators. One writer says one thing in his commenta uh, commentary and another offers some different thoughts, different perspective. So across the board what we have is much confusion and uncertainty. We find some who tell us that tithing is mandatory and that all Christians without exception must practice it, must tithe. On the other extreme are those folks who claim tithing belongs under the law. And because it's under the law, it has no relevancy for 21st century Christians today. And you'll find people in, uh, in between both of those spectrums. Second reason it's important to talk about tithing is because of the financial condition of churches in America. Recent Gallup polls reveal, think about this, church members in America of all denominations, ask yourself this, give what percent of their income to all charities, including the Red Cross, the Salvation Army, the United Way, the Community Chess, Boy Scouts, and their church? What percent of their income do you think people that go to church give to charities? 2%. They give 2% of their income. Now, Christian financial speakers like Larry Burkett and Ron Blue tell us that the average evangelical Christian in America is giving between 2 and 3% of his income to the Lord's work. Now, here, God has blessed us with generous givers. And I understand that some folks give far more than a tithe to the Lord's work here at what will be known as West Hills Community Church. Some give a tithe, but they also give outside of the body to other charities. And I can tell you this, I have no clue what anyone gives, and I never want to have a clue of what anyone wants to give. Third, talking about tithing is important because the fact is this. The Bible has a lot to say about it. The crux of the matter may be this. Well, some are aware that the Old Testament teaches about tithing, but does the New Testament say anything about tithing? Is tithing relevant? 
Is it applicable to us today? Is tithing, is it just, was it meant for the nation of Israel in the Old Testament? Or is it something that we as God's people should be preaching and practicing today? Since it was practiced in the age of the Mosaic Law, the law that God gave to Moses for the people of Israel, are we still to tithe today? And I want to remind you, as always, that the Word of God is our final authority. And we're going to look at several scriptural passages And I encourage you to follow along in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, there should be a Bible in the back of the pew directly in front of you. And we're going to begin with the Old Testament passages. And don't just take my word for it. Read along with us so you can see it's right here in black and white. And we're going to begin with Genesis chapter 14. God is our final authority. I don't want you to ever believe anything unless you see it in the Bible. And you have the freedom, here's the fact, you have the freedom to reach your own conclusion. After all, it's your money, at least in theory it is. If tithing is a biblical concept, then we should practice it. But it's critical, vital that we understand what the Bible teaches us. And so we want to begin with a a definition of tithing. You can turn to uh, Genesis 14. But tithing, the word tithe literally means one-tenth of anything. In the Old Testament, a tithe was more than just giving one-tenth of your money to the Lord. If you had ten cows, you gave one of the cows to the Lord. If you had ten pounds of grain, one pound of grain was given to the Lord as your tithe. Just keep in mind this, that a tithe is one-tenth of anything. So to tithe your income is to tithe one-tenth of your income to God. So we're going to look at the Old Testament beginning in Genesis chapter 14, and I'll just give you a a brief summary of the preceding verses before we look at verse 18. This chapter is a record of the Old Testament patriarch, Abram, who went to war to bring back his son, his uh, nephew, Lot. He had gone to war against Kedalarmer and the kings who were allied with Kedalarmer. It had been a bloody, bruising, vicious battle. In the end, Abram triumphed. And now he's coming home with the spoils of war. He's bringing the slaves that he captured, the soldiers that he'd taken captive. He's bringing back food that he had gathered from those he defeated, their grain, their wine, the oil. He brought back livestock, cattle, and sheep. And with all the spoils in tow as he's making his way back home, he's a victorious general. And on the way, we read in verse 18 that he meets an unusual character. It says, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. And he was priest of God Most High. Read on in verse 19. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And verse 20. And blessed be God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. And then Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. If you're somewhat familiar with the Old Testament, you know that Melchizedek appears in two texts in the Old Testament here in Genesis 14, and, but also in Psalm 110. And then he shows up in the New Testament book of Hebrews. And as you study the book of Hebrews, it becomes clear that Melchizedek is the Old Test, in the Old Testament is a type, a pattern, a representative of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. So who is this guy named Melchizedek? We don't have a lot of information about him. He just shows up on the stage here in Genesis 14, 18, and he meets with Abram as he's coming back from battle. And he introduces himself as the priest of the Most High God, the same God that you and I worship today. And he blessed Abram in verse 19. And then he proceeds to bless God. Now notice Abram's response in verse 20. He decides to give a tenth of everything that he had. A tenth of the slaves, the the soldiers, the food, and everything else he had taken from the enemy in his victory. Now, why did Abram do that? Why did he offer a tenth? Because it was an act of his submission to God, to the God that Melchizedek served. Who told Abram to do that? We can't say with certainty because this is the very first time in the Word of God that tithing shows up. But I know this, as you read it, it's not here in Genesis 14, an act that was commanded. It was purely voluntary on the part of Abram's part. He understood this, that the God that Melchizedek served was responsible for his victory. And in essence, 
Abram was communicating this. Lord, by giving you this tithe, I am admitting, I am professing that I did not win this battle by myself. Victory belongs to you alone, O Lord. And it's significant that the very first time we see tithing in the Word of God, it's not tied up in the law that God gave to Moses, the Mosaic law. Tithing in Genesis 14 was purely voluntary. It was a display of personal submission to God and gratitude for all His blessings. Now turn, if you're in Genesis, just two books back, Exodus and Leviticus, and you'll come to Leviticus chapter 27 and verses 30 to 34. It says, A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, a tithe of everything belongs to the Lord. It is holy. It is separate. It is consecrated to the Lord. And if a man redeems any of his tithe, he must add a fifth of the value to it. The entire tithe of herd and flock, every tenth animal that passes under the shepherd's rod will be holy to the Lord. And that shepherd must not pick out the good from the bad or make any substitution. And if he does make a substitution, both the animal and its substitute become holy and cannot be redeemed. These are the commands the Lord gave Moses on Mount Sinai for the Israelites. Genesis 14 was 400 years before the giving of the Mosaic Law. Now we move ahead. We skip ahead 400 years. We find ourselves now in the time of the Mosaic Law. God is giving the law to Moses for the people of Israel. And note two things about this passage here in Leviticus 27. It's part of the Old Testament law, the Mosaic Law. What happened, as I said, in Genesis 14 occurred before the law was given. But this passage in Leviticus 27 is part of the law. It's a commandment given by God to the nation as part of the Mosaic law. Second, the tithe was to encompass all that a man possessed. It wasn't relegated, limited to just his money. It included his livestock, his wine, his grain, his fruit. A tithe was to be given back to God from everything that a man possessed. As for livestock, we're told that the shepherd was to have his sheep pass and his, and his cattle pass under his rod. And every tenth animal was to be set apart to the Lord. Now, if the tenth animal happened to be scrawny, that was okay. But if it happened to be a healthy cow or sheep, it was not supposed to be replaced with the scrawny one and say, well, wait a minute, wait, I don't want to give something good up to the Lord. I'm going to give him the scrawny one. It wasn't supposed to be like that. You know, sometimes you play a game in school and they're going count off by twos. If you're at the end of the line, you go, I'm going to switch places because I want to be with my friend in school. I want to make sure we're in the same every other one. Well, you weren't to do that with the sheep and cattle going, one, two, three, I've got to move this tenth one because it's a good one. No, you weren't supposed to do that. There was to be no intentionally keeping the best for oneself. The key point is this. In Leviticus 27, God is very clear about what he wanted. He wanted his people to give a tenth of everything. Now, Go to the book of Deuteronomy, which isn't much further back. Leviticus, Numbers, and then Deuteronomy, chapter 14, verses 22 to 23. A few more years down the road, and we read this. Be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. Eat the tithe of your grain, new wine, and oil, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks in the presence of the Lord your God at the place he will choose as a dwelling place for his name, so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. Forty years now have passed, and the Israelites are about to go into the Promised Land. They're in the banks of the Jordan River. And Moses, their leader, is about to die. But before he dies, he delivers one final message to the people of God. The last phrase of verse 23 reveals the purpose of the Old Testament tithe. You read it. It says that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. Now, the Living Bible renders it this way, so that you may learn always to put God first in your life. That's the purpose of the tithe. It was never intended to be a legalistic regulation or requirement. It was meant to be much more than just an Old Testament income tax. God intended to have the tithe be a reminder that His people were to put Him first in everything. You put Him first in your giving so that you will be mindful to give God 
first place in every area of your life. Now, the sad truth is this. There are a lot of people in churches across America that have never learned this basic and simple secret of giving. They don't put for God first when it comes to their giving their income. When they get their paycheck, they put everything else first. Out come the taxes, and then the mortgage payment, or the rent, then the car payment, then the groceries, then the credit card, then the vacation money, then the clothes. And finally, if there's anything left over, they give it to God. Many believers have never learned that God not only watches what you give, but He watches when you give it. Not only does the amount of giving reveal something about your priorities, the order in which you do your giving says something about your priorities. So let me ask you, think about this for a moment. When you get your paycheck, which bills or checks do you write out first? Here's the real answer. The ones that are most important to you, you make sure you write those out first. By that act, you're making a statement about what is first and foremost in importance in your life. The purpose in tithing is to teach God's people to put Him first in everything. Colossians 1.18 says that in all things, He might have preeminence or He might have first place. Now turn to the last book of the Bible, the book of Malachi. It's just a short book of four chapters. And in Malachi chapter 3, if you don't know where it is, go to Matthew and Go back one book in the Bible toward the front, and you see God asking a question of His people in Malachi chapter 3, and I think He asked that same question to the church today, Malachi 3, verses 8 to 12. Will a man rob God? And yet you rob me. But you ask, God, how do we rob you? And God's response is, in tithes and in offerings. You are under curse, the whole nation of you, because you're robbing me. You're withholding your tithes. You're not giving to me your tithes. And then he says, he offers them a test in verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there would be food in my house. God says, test me in this. The Lord Almighty says, and see, if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Test me. There are three things to notice in this passage here in Malachi. First, there's a warning to the people of God. Because God says this, in withholding tithing, you are in fact robbing me. Read it. That's what God said. And by spending on yourself instead of giving to God a tenth of what you own, you displease the Lord. God says to His people, I have cursed you because you've not put me first in your life. Second from this passage, we read, God issues a challenge to those who would doubt Him. God says, go ahead and put me to the test. Dare to obey what I'm saying and see if I won't open the floodgates of heaven and bless you abundantly. I will bless you, God says, beyond your wildest dreams. I will do things that you never ever thought about just because you dare to obey me. And third, there's a secondary purpose revealed for giving the tithe, so that the house of God may be fully supplied. Here in Malachi 3, we have Almighty God, the maker of heaven and earth, saying to His people, you are robbing me in order to get more. But because you're robbing me by withholding your tithe, your offerings, you are actually going to end up with less. God says, if you would just dare to give me what rightfully belongs to me, I would bless you beyond all comprehension. So let me sum up these four Old Testament passages with what I see as the three greatest purposes of the tithe. In relationship to the tithe and to God, the tithe was meant to glorify Him, to acknowledge Him as the Lord Almighty, the source of all human blessings. That's the gist of Genesis 14 and Abram giving a tithe to Melchizedek. In relationship to God's people, the purpose of the tithe is to teach us to put God first in all parts of our life. And then third, in relationship to the nation of Israel, the purpose of the tithe is to ensure that God's work must be fully supplied. Isn't that beautiful? We can learn those same three lessons. We can make proper application. We've looked at the Old Testament. 
Now the real question comes when we look into the New Testament. And let's look at two passages. The one we began with, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. And I'll read them again for you. Now about the collection for God's people. Paul says, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. What did he tell them to do? On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. The teaching is very clear. Giving is to be regular, systematic, on the first day of every week. Giving is to be personal. It's up to you as an individual. It says each one of you. And giving is to be proportional, as you read there. Set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income. Christian giving is to be regular. It's to be intentionally budgeted. It's to be personal. It's to be proportional. You say, what are you talking about when you talk about proportional giving? It means this. The more God blesses you, the more you're able to give. That's New Testament grace giving. We're no longer under the age of law. We're under the age of grace. The more you're blessed, the more you're able to give. If you have little blessing, financially or materially, then you're only able to give a small portion. The more you're blessed, the bigger your portion you'll be able to give. 10% isn't the issue in the New Testament. Some Christians who are greatly blessed ought to give 20, 15%. Others ought to give 20%. Some who are enormously blessed could give 20 to 25%. I'll stop with that. But you get the idea. The greater the blessing from God, the greater the portion of giving should be. Now, think about this. You look like pretty intelligent people. So follow with me. If you make $10,000 and you give a tenth as a tithe, how much are you giving? Thousand. Very good. You have how much left to live on? Nine thousand. If you make $100,000 and you give a tenth, how much did you give? Ten thousand. And now how much do you have to live on? Ninety thousand. So the person who's making ninety thousand should be able to give more than the person making 10000 It's that it lives on $9,000. Here's the bottom line. It's an individual choice. It's something that you and I need to pray about. And the greater the blessing from God, the greater amounts we can give. So the question begs, if New Testament grace giving exceeds tithing, does that mean that tithing is irrelevant? For us today? No. The answer is no. In the Old Testament, we have a command. In the New Testament, that command becomes a model. In the Old Testament, we had a flat 10%. In the New Testament, we have unlimited proportional giving. It says, in keeping with his income. What was a percentage now becomes a proportion. And I have to confess that this has spoken to me. I grew up tithing, practicing tithing since I was a teenager, learning the principle of tithing. If your young people work, it's good to teach them about tithing. No matter how little they make, just say, you know what? A tenth of that should belong to the Lord. And as they grow, hopefully they understand that. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7, our last passage that we're going to look up. If you're in 1 Corinthians, it shouldn't be hard for you to find 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. Paul writes this. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion or obligation, because the Lord loves what kind of a giver? A cheerful giver. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. Is there any promised blessing to generous givers in the New Testament? Paul's pretty clear in 2 Corinthians 9. He says, if you sow a little, you can expect to reap a little. You sow a lot, you reap a lot. Paul's talking about giving. Now let's read on in verse 8. And he said, God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Look at all the alls there. Notice all the alls. She told me she was leaving. She's not offended by the tithing, so let's get that. <laughs> she, she, she told me she was leaving, all right? <laughs> but uh, I just had to say that. I won't even say her name because I don't want to embarrass her. But uh, It was... 
if you read all those, God promises to take care of us. And look at verses 10 and 11. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Same promise in the New Testament we have in the Old Testament. God basically is promising to abundantly Christians who practice generous giving. Now listen to me. Listen very carefully. In no way am I saying that if you give financially, generously, that God is obligated to bless you financially or materially. I'm not saying you write this large check and then run to the mailbox and hopefully you get compensated with an even larger amount. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that God says He will bless you. And that way is often peace and joy, knowing Lord, I've been obedient. This is what you led me. This is what your spirit put on my heart to give, and I'm being obedient. I've prayed about what I'm giving. And so some Christians who give generously, understand this, undergo great suffering. Giving is no guarantee that you will, your life's automatically going to become this bed of roses. Don't let that fact mislead you. Anytime that you decide to step out in faith and you dare to trust God by giving generously after praying, listen to me, you will never regret it. God is no man's debtor. He will pay you back. Press down, good measure, running over. How God chooses to bless you is His business. These verses in 2 Corinthians 9 simply tell us that God will bless us. God's faithful. He cannot lie. Here's the summary of New Testament teaching concerning tithing in this, the age of grace. What was a command in the Old Testament is now a model. What was a percentage, 10% in the Old Testament, is now a proportion. What was a promise, though, is still a promise. Those who put God to the test in this area of giving will never be disappointed. So I want to offer you some general conclusions. Two extremes to avoid when it comes to tithing. The first extreme is the danger of us saying, well, I'm going to give that 10%, but the rest of it's all mine to do as, ever as I please. Listen, every good gift cometh down from above, from the Father of lights. God's given you whatever you have. The other 90% still should be spent as a wise steward of God. Yes, it's, you possess it, but He still wants to you, you to use that wisely in a way that pleases Him. The other extreme is using the lack of a standard, the tithe, as an excuse to give nothing. Oh, we're not under the law anymore, so we don't have to give much, and I'm just going to hoard. I'll give God a little bit, but I'm going to hoard the rest. We don't have time, but in Malachi, God says, you know what? Some of you people are giving me leftovers. When you bring your sacrificial animal, you're giving me the sick one, the weak one, the one that you don't want. You're giving me leftovers. I think that happens in churches sometimes because we don't pray about and we don't think about, God, what do you want me to give? So what we do is we, before we go to church or we come to church, we pull out our wallet or our checkbook and we say, let's see what's in there. And let's be honest. What's in there a lot of times is not much. Well, God, I'm sorry, this will have to do this week. I spent a lot of money on other things, but I didn't budget you into my life into my finances. And sometimes we give flippantly. Second, there's no contradiction between the Old and the New Testament so long as we do not apply the teaching of the tithe in a legalistic way. Make it a noose, a burden around people's necks. God never, ever intended that tithing be a burden. He meant for it to be a way His blessings could flow in and through you, that you can bless others in this world. You can bless others through the ministry of the local church that you attend. When we moved into this building, God was taking care of us and people were giving generously at the theater. One of the discussions among the leaders, of the, should we then begin now, we've had the popcorn bucket because we thought it'd be a novel way, a, a low-pressured way. Should we now start passing an offering plate by? So that people go, oh, here it comes by my way. i got to put something in because the person next to me is going to know if I don't put anything in. So we just said, you know what? God's been faithful. The people have been generous giving. We're just going to put that offering, that bucket back there. And the popcorn bucket and people can give however. I love that. I love when visitors come and go, I didn't see you take up a formal offering. And I say, well, there's a bucket there if you want to give. 
no one should ever feel under compulsion, obligated, that they have to give. Another thing, the tithe remains the best, most accurate, most effective guide and standard for Christian giving. I encourage you to practice tithing in your life. I like what Larry Burkett said. As best I can tell, God never asked for less than 10% from anyone. Then he went on and said, if that bothers someone, I see no reason why they couldn't give twice as much if they desired. 10% bothers you? And you think, well, that's not enough, then double what you want. Let me conclude by saying that I believe the tithe is the most accurate guide for Christian giving. It's the beginning point. Please, hear me. Don't walk out of here and say, that pastor put us on a guilt trip. I don't want one person to be burdened, forced. Oh, I got to give. He beat us up. The tithe is, not, is meant to be a blessing. It's not a straitjacket. If you hear what I'm saying and you feel under pressure, then I tell you this. In all sincerity, it would be better for you to give 1% with joy than 10% under duress and go, I feel guilty. That's why I'm doing this. God not only cares what you give and when you give, but how you give with a cheerful heart. That word means with a delirious, God, man, this is awesome. I get to give back to you. That's how we should be singing with a cheerful heart. And our giving should reflect the same thing. You are free in Christ Jesus to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. And I can only share from my own personal experience for Sandy and I. When we were first married 35 years ago, we made very little. We made $10,000, $200 a week. And we made it a matter of prayer and priority to give to the Lord's work. And let me assure you that He's blessed us beyond our wildest dreams. We didn't even know we were poor back then. We, when we went on vacation, we went to Florida, but we drove to Florida because we couldn't afford to fly. And when we went down there, we stayed with a lady that happened to be Mallory's babysitter and moved down there. We stayed with her in a, in a retirement community in a, a double-wide trailer. And I would sleep on the floor, and then this lady would get up in the middle of the night and trip over me. We, have a, we, we had a lot of great memories. It wasn't like we were missing out on anything. God took care of us, and He's always taken care of us. And He will take care of you. He will meet your needs if you step out in faith and, and trust Him. God's blessed us beyond our wildest dreams. I'm not talking about that God's given us this financial windfall. I'm saying that God's given us incredible peace and joy. I love when we go home, we're maybe somewhere and they're talking about a ministry and a need or a missionary speaking or a ministry talking about something. We'll go home and Sandy will say, we should give something to them. What do you think we should give? That's wonderful to have that in common with my wife. It's like, let's, okay, what do you think? And God just blesses. We've tied throughout our marriage and, and watched God do amazing things. And I, I say we're practicing proportional giving. The more our income increases, the more percentage increases. And I look at others sometimes and I say, look at what they have. And look what they drive. And you know what? I tell Sandy something. We could have those same things if we didn't tithe all those years. But I wouldn't trade places with those people in a million years. Because God has blessed us. And, and we were at the Tomlin concert. And I'm like, Sandy's in front of me singing and, and because the stage was that way. And I'm going, wow, this Lord, this is awesome to have a wife who loves Jesus. I'm blessed. I'm a wealthy man. Thank you, Lord. And I look at others, and sometimes I say, I don't care what they have. I wouldn't trade places with them. Here's your homework. Go home and prayerfully review the scriptures we've looked at. Then ask God, God what is your will for me in this area of giving? I'm going to look down at my finances. And I encourage you to consider taking a 90-day tithing challenge. For the next 90 days, commit to giving at least a tenth of your income to the Lord. Listen, I will say this. If you have bills that you need to meet and you can't give that tenth, you are obligated to pay those bills. I think it's a poor testament if you say uh, to the bank or somebody else, I, I gave what I was going to give to you to the church. They're not going to go, God bless you, thanks for doing that. <laughs> They're going to go, what's the name of your church? What's the name of that pastor? Dalman's Dave Roman. But, uh, <laughs> but at the end of the day, 90 days, you can either continue tithing or stop. It's as simple as that. Now, I'm not promising you're going to get more money. I'm not telling you you're going to get a new job. I'm not going to tell you that you're going to win the sweepstakes and something comes in the mail and says, congratulations, you won a million dollars, you got a new car. 
anything like that. I'm not suggesting your bills will be paid in advance. You're going to come across some major financial windfall. If after 90 days you don't feel like continuing or you feel unwanted pressure, you're going broke, you don't think it works for you, and you don't believe that God's kept His Word, then just stop tithing. I'm certain of two things. God's going to keep His Word. And make sure what, you, what I've told you is in accordance with His Word. And then try the 90-day tithe challenge. Let's pray. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, maybe you're here and you... Listen, before God wants your money, He wants your heart. He wants a relationship with you. And maybe you're here and you say, Pastor, I'm not even sure that I have a relationship with God. I want that. How do I get that? You can have it by praying a prayer similar to this in the quietness of your own heart. Dear Lord Jesus, today I, I acknowledge the fact that I am a sinner. And Lord, I understand you went to the cross of Calvary. And on that cross, you took my sins on your body. You shed your blood. You gave your life to pay for my sin. Lord Jesus, I am sorry. Would you please forgive me? Would you cleanse me? Jesus, I'm opening my life. I'm inviting you in to be my Savior. And I want to follow you as the ruler of my life from this moment on. Thank you for saving me. So our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. If you prayed that prayer today and asked Jesus into your life, just ask you to slip your hand. I'm not going to point you out in any fashion whatsoever. You say, Pastor, I prayed today. I asked Jesus into my life. Father, thank you for the practicality of your word. Lord, you gave us your very best. You didn't give us leftovers. You gave us your son, Jesus Christ, on the cross to take our place. We sang the song, You, my king, would die for me. That's mind-boggling. How do we explain it? There is no explanation other than in your sovereignty and your love for us, your unconditional, everlasting love. You chose to send your son to the cross so that we can have a relationship with you. Lord, help us to prayerfully evaluate our giving. It is a personal thing, Lord, between us and you. And Lord, it's not to be out of obligation or grudgingly. Whatever we give, Lord, is to be cheerfully done. Lord, we thank you that you have blessed us here in America in so many ways. And so, Lord, I pray that we continue to give. Give first of our very lives and then our talents, our finances, our time, our energy. Lord, I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.